lesson and welcome to those coming in by the garage. We've been doing a lesson on the how-tos. And really, this one here is tonight on how to walk in communion. Amen. Now, can anybody tell me what they believe communion means? You want to throw out some answers? Remember, it's an open Bible study. Communion, what's communion mean to you? Now, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what it means to you. Anybody like to go ahead? Good, that would work, communicating with God. Would it involve anything more than just communication Cleansing. words? Cleansing. Cleansing, yeah, that would fit in there. Well, really, communion means that God would come. Remember the scripture in, in Revelations 3 that Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. knock. How's the rest of it go, everybody? And if any man hear my voice and open the door and invite me in, I and my Father will come in. I don't know, I missed it up right there. And we will make our home or we will sup with you. Communion is God being at home with you. And now listen to me. And you being at home with him. Everyone say, I'm at home with God. And I want God to be at home with me. And the only way that he wouldn't be comfortable with you, and we have two scriptures on it, grieving the spirit and quenching the spirit, is when we walk too much in the flesh. And then it seems like we push the Holy Spirit away. We don't mean to, but the flesh has a thing in it all of us really don't like, and that is pride. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God God's getting rid of it. We all have a form of pride. Ladies have a form of variety of pride, men too. And remember, there's a positive pride and a negative pride. Who wants to make a stab at the negative pride? What would that be? Well, pride is focused on self, and a poor me, maybe depression, or focus on self is perfect. That's a great answer. And what would be the positive? The same answer, really. What would be the positive expression of pride? I'm a macho man. I'm not referring to the song, because the president plays the song in, in his crusades. Huh? Confidence in what? Okay, okay, amen. So, so let's go ahead and go through this and let's have fun. So in this uh, lesson, hasn't it been really good so far? I hope you've learned a bunch of things so that you could put them to practice in your lives. And so I hope that you caught some of the principles. It's not what's taught so much. Now listen, it's what ca it's caught. Teaching is great and in the Bible, and there's some wonderful teachers on 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 the TV and on the radio, and, and, but it's what we catch that becomes very personal. And like I was sharing, like, um, like uh, Joe shared last week, he gets the anointing when the words of truth come out and the Spirit bears witness with him. That's how God pulls the teachings off of the page that per, to directly relate to you. In other words, not all of our walk is the same. We all have different callings. We are different parts of the body. One an eye, one a foot. Me, a floating kidney and body of Christ. You follow what I'm saying? So we want the word of God to not only be generally instructing us, but specifically instructing us. So if you read the Bible, you're going to get what God's will is generally. How many of thou shall not steal? You're going to get some basic general ideas. But for specifics, if God needs to work out specifics, how you're going to do it, when you're going to get it done, uh, I know to lay hands on the sick, what, how do you want me to do it, this kind of thing. The specifics come by the Holy Spirit. We got the Word of God, and then the Holy Spirit takes the specifics out. He pulls from the Word of God off the page what we need to know, and he helps us to apply that Word in the calling that we're called. Can you say amen? So if you're called to be a teacher, you're, what interests you is study, reading, looking at things. If maybe you're an exhorter, what interests you is people getting in order. <laughs> they have different callings. All right, so we've been learning different things. Okay. 
Say, I have everything that Jesus accomplished when he died and rose again. I'm complete in him because he's the head of all principality and power. Okay, so when we're going to learn to commune with God, God has to feel at home in us. And in order for that to happen, we've got to learn to begin to spend more time with him. Amen? Can I have to say amen? I mean, Linda and I are standing amazed. The last two days, we've been able to help so many people. And you know what? We're not looking to reach out and help. See, Jesus never say, hey, I'm Jesus. Let me help you. Okay? No, they heard about him, and they came to Jesus, didn't they? Well, nowadays in the New Testament, God is saying, hey, let me help you, children of God. But we have to be open and relaxed enough to let God come. Can you say amen? And then when he comes, is he relaxed enough around you that he will stay? Well, we know that's true. God says, I will come. I will live in you. I will talk in you. I will walk in you. I will be your God. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we know that, but in order for God to really reveal things to us, we've got to settle in and learn how to commune with him. Can you say amen? amen? Just learn how to interact with God throughout the day. All right, so go with me to John 17, please. We're going to look at verse 20 through 24. That's really why we need to be open for his input and instruction. Okay, so I'm halfway through your paragraph at the top. See it? See the word instruction? Next word is being in communion with God creates change. Now, folks, believe it or not, when I came out of Bible college, I thought Bible college changed you. And the sad thing about that was is it's not the receiving of the word that changes us. It's the receiving and the doing of the word that brings about change. Amen? I liken a wise man who hears the word and does it. When the winds come and the floods blow, it can't destroy it. Why? It's founded on the rock. Why? Because the person is listening to God and practicing what God wants them to do. Everyone say, I listen to God. And I practice what he wants me to do. Now, your mind might go, check, check. You don't do everything. Well, that's just the devil throwing it at you. You're going to do your best to do what God instructs you to do. And if you fail at that, you don't open your mouth and say, I've always failed at that. No, huh? Do it, and God will help you in the steps of doing it. If you never make an effort, God can never meet you in that effort. Hello? Are you with me? So catch this as we read a little bit more. We need to practice in communion to be in communion with God. It will bring about change. Our exposure to his presence and the anointing develops the spirit man and its influence in our lives. Amen. Then God's love permeates into our very being and we begin to take on God's likeness. Let's understand, right underneath the very last of the paragraph there, let's understand something about ourselves. Without a deep fellowship with God, we seem to dry up and become hardened and insensitive to loving others and serving God. So let us stay in communion with God and let us always, God, bring us refreshing every time we open our hearts to him. Amen. So I'll just tell you this way. I start my day off. By meeting with God, I don't do anything ritualistic or there's no specific time when I wake up. The first thing I say is, good morning, God. It might be on my way, excuse me, to the men's room. But I still greet him. And I say, Lord, thank you. And I'm yawning, rubbing my eyes, you know, doing. And then then I just continue the conversation. I say, Lord... I just want to let you know that I come to you and I want you to groom me. I want you to help me shut down any kind of bad thinking, any confrontations that I might have today, Lord. I want you to be already prepare me for them so my mind's not occupied, occupied about what the future's going to bring, but rather being with you throughout the day. That's really communion. And it took me a while to really learn that, to feel comfortable 
Because I remember the first time God, you know, started to work in my life. My flesh wanted to crawl under the rug. How many of you ever sensed the first time when the presence of God was really strong, you just kind of almost felt this feeling of running and hiding? You didn't know what to do, you know? But after a while, if you continue to practice your relationship with God, your communing becomes almost natural. Well, almost normal. We'll use that term as far as spiritual, spirituality goes. Okay, John 17. We're going to go right to the text there. John 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who believe in me through their word. You see, we're to preach what? The word, right? And even the disciples, they're going to be leading people to the Lord all through their life, even when Jesus goes to be with his Father and sends us the Holy Spirit. In verse 21, now, this is before Jesus goes to the garden. So he's praying God's covenant upon those that believe on God through him. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. See, notice today, you and I, New Testament believers, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is where? In us. And where are we? In him. So Jesus said, this is going to be a mystery that's fulfilled when you accept Jesus. And he says, and the glory which you have given me, verse 22, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. What does one mean? One here means in unity. It means grafted in. It says we be the all of wild branches, right? But we are grafted into the olive tree through Christ, right? Amen? Amen. Even though we weren't born a Jew, we through Christ are accepted in the beloved, so therefore we become a part of God again. Now think about the beginning. This one might be hard for you to grasp, but think about in the beginning. Was there, a, was there anything evil in the very, very, very beginning? No. Just all good, all God, all light. No darkness at all. Correct? God's perfect. No flaws. Amen? Everything he made is perfect. No flaws. But he made certain creatures with the ability to choose. And one was the angels, and the other was man. Okay? I'm not sure about animals. I haven't talked to them lately. (laughs) We know Satan chose the wrong thing. You have chosen incorrectly. And cause this great big problem. We know Adam chose incorrectly. Correct. Just follow me because I'm I'm staying on the subject. Just follow me. Don't be drifting and say, why aren't you reading from the page? Because just reading from the page isn't going to do it. It's only going to show you basics. You take the page home and study it. Meanwhile, let me teach you the word, okay? So somebody had that question and wanted an answer to it. So, So in them... And I in them, and you in me, verse 23, that they may be made what? Perfect in one. So it says the longer we stay in communion with God, we'll become what? Perfect, or the Greek word is teleos, or mature. We'll take on a God maturity by fellowshipping and communing with God. Say amen. Amen. But you and I can't spend time, Pastor Kerry, all day long in prayer. No, you can't officially. You have to do work. You have to do, you go through the, uh, your routines during the day, right? But you can bring God along. Well, I automatically bring God along wherever I go. God lives in me, right, Pastor Kerry? Yeah, but not all day long do you talk with him. We don't, and and, and there's no shame in not doing that. But the idea of communing with God is you get to a place to realize, number one, that he's there. And number two, he's always listening because you have Jesus in your heart. But he has to feel welcome by your conversation with him. Amen. What happens when there's two friends together and one friend's not talking and the other friend's talking? One friend's eventually going to look at the other one and say, is there something wrong? Huh? 
Now let me ask you, Christians, is there something wrong that you can't talk with the God who lives in you and walks around you in and out throughout the day? It takes discipline. I'm not talking about heavy discipline. It takes, first of all, thought to remember to do that. Third, uh, secondly, a, a desire to want to do that. Thir thirdly, knowing God is there and he's always listening to you. What that does after a p short period of time, it causes you to settle in and relax and open up to God more. And guess what? So when you're about to do something wrong, not, not a sin, but you're, you're going to do the right thing the wrong way, and when you have done that and you're with God, God will speak up and says, no. Don't do that. And you've got to be sensitive enough to hear him say that, to stop. And that comes through communing with God. Getting used to that still, small impression or voice that kind of ministers to us. Now, honey, I'm going to ask for hands on this one. How many has ever had God stop you in the middle of a project and say you're doing it wrong? If not, <laughs> you've got a good time to look forward to. Amen, because every once in a while we always do things wrong. You know, don't forget, God says, without me, you can do nothing right. Amen, you can do nothing, and, 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 and without me, you're nothing, right? So we know that, so we are got to be so dependent upon God, okay, in the area of allowing him to commune with us. I'd rather have his wisdom, right? I get in a situation, and I got four or five prob potential problems I'm looking at, maybe people. And it could be a bad scene. If you're listening to God, he'll diffuse the whole thing and show you what to say, what to do. That comes through communing with God for a while. A lot of us are real busy people. And some of, some of us Christians are too busy because you're not praying. You're not seeking God. You love God with all your heart. But you're not seeking him. He needs to develop that confidence that for you to have in him. So whenever situation of life comes, you know that God's in charge about it. Amen. So communion brings about a confidence and a trust that can only build that way. We often grow not by what we experience in life, but we grow mostly by our time we spend with God. Because if you think about it, plants don't learn how to shape themselves by coming against hard weather. Okay? And if there's no nutrients in the soil, that's not good either. But the right sun, the right nutrients, the right atmosphere, that plant will flourish. Can you say amen? The right atmosphere with God, you will flourish. We just got to get you under the sun. So when we're submitting to God in our prayer time or without, throughout the day, you know, exchanging and communion, he's changing us. If you can imagine, okay, a, a, a film negative. How many have ever worked with a film, maybe in high school, in a dark room, film negative, any kind of exposure on the film, it's going to pick up that light, Right? Well, you're like a piece of film. And more exposure you can open up to God, the more like him you become. The more like him you reflect. And so through the time, supposedly through our walk, through the years of our walk and days through our walk, we're supposed to be coming more and more used to God and us walking one by one. Father, that they may be one even as you and I are one. It comes through a process of time, come communing. So a lot of Christians, they don't know anything more than, oh, communion, that's when you take the wine and the bread. But that's the little part. The wine and the bread is you partaking of God all day long. Okay, so let's look at some things. A couple of points under your, your one, two, three, four, five points there, okay, under John 24. Okay, number one, spiritually, we are one in communion with God when we become born again and walk with Christ. Now, we might start off real slow, but we'll develop. 
Can you say amen? Now, how many here know what exposure is? When you, when you click the camera, and let's say it's nighttime, you're going to need more light flooding in there. So what do you do with the shutter? You leave the shutter open longer, so if it's dark, the light could get in. So real photographers know all of just their photography. Nowadays, we have cameras that do that. Everything does it automatically. If you want more light when it's real dark, you leave the shutter open slightly. And they used to have on the old cameras a little dial that said shutter time, da, you know. So when it, instead of going click, it goes click. and lets more light in before it. Probably Marvin could explain it a lot better than me. Here's what happens. We're exposed to the world and we're exposed to God. But you have to mentally, what do you mean exposed to the world? Didn't you get up this morning? Breathe, walk, put on everything, right? Where were you? You're in the world. But you're still of God, aren't you? What I'm trying to say is, it's not until you put your mind on God that the spiritual part of your day opens. Okay? You get up, you got the physical part of your day. Naturally, you can't see God. But when you purposely set your mind on the Lord, suddenly seeing him opens up. Why is that? Why does that happen? Why is it we can speak the name of Jesus and power of God right opens up? It's no mystery. Why is it? What? He want, he's always wanting to communicate, always wanting to help us, but he needs us to open up. And, and we're not doing that. We're not sinning by not opening up. We're just learning to stay open. Can you say amen? amen? We're learning it. It takes a process of time to stay open. You know? It's like the person there in a stare contest. You know, I'm in a stare contest with my wife. She always wins. And that's when you don't blink, you know? You stare and who blinks first is out. You know? God wants us to really stare into his face, really you know, so that he can get as much of his impression into us. Can you say amen? So where is the place, I'm, 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 after I say this, we're going to move on to the next points. Where is the place that you can stare and you can always see God? Your Bible. The Word. Amen. And the word helps us to see God, right? And then eventually, you can just see him automatically without opening it. See, I got him everywhere. Amen. There's God here, pictures of the Lord to remind us that's our focus. Okay. Amen. So let's go through a couple more points. Point three is we were accepted and absorbed into God when we accepted Jesus Christ. Now we're in his plan. We're in his purpose. Say, God loves me. God has a purpose for me. So even become, we become a part of his family. Now there's a scripture over in 1 John chapter 5 where it says something really odd. Now, I'm going to say this to you so that you understand. God originally, when he made Adam and Eve, were we a part of him? Yes. He was a part of us, and we are a part of him. But because of Adam's disobedience, we broke off. Therefore, you got the, the scripture, it says, and a branch breaks off the vine. It's still a branch, but it's a dead branch now. And so in Adam, we all fell off the vine. But God says, if you will accept my son, Jesus Christ, I'll graft you back in, and the Spirit of God will start walking with you, and you'll be transformed back into his image. How many of you are like that? Yes! Amen. But it takes us communing with the Lord. So, thirdly, we have been accepted. Now we need and absorbed into God's plan. Fourthly, the word for communion is the Greek word kononia. Everyone say kononia. It's also the word for fellowship. It's also with a word for intimacy, to be intimate. It's also likened, and I don't like to use this too much, but as a husband and wife, they consummate their marriage, they get, become intimate. 
and have children, you know, from it. Okay? It's, ta- it's not talking about sex per se, but we need to become intimate with God. In other words, he should be the first one that we go to. When we hurt, he should be the first one we say, God, I hurt. See, I have a partner over there, and I'm not afraid to say anything that I'm going through and discuss it with her, and she's not with me either. But that took a a period of time. And you know, with society today, everybody's playing a head game. Never play a head game with God. He already knows where you're at. The trouble is we don't. So by spending the time with him, communing with God, we become transformed into his very personality and his nature and his lifestyle. Amen? And I tell you what, did Jesus have any problem making friends? Not at the beginning. Everybody in the world, and their brother was wanting to get to Jesus. It wasn't until he started declaring that he was the Messiah and started coming against the people of the time that they all rose up and Satan says, there, there's my opportunity, you know. And so it was religious people that killed our Savior. So remember, you would say, well, if you were such a good person, why are you going through that? Well, Jesus was absolutely perfect, and they killed him. So that's a bad excuse to use. So the best thing I can tell you is what my pastor told me. Learn to commune with God throughout the day. Because that's when God begins to share his rich wisdom and his insight to you, and he begins to show you your future and how it's going to come together. And see, there's nothing like that. And God does it in a manner, now listen, where Satan can't even figure out what's going on. Here you're communing with God, and you're, you're walking through your day, you're doing your daily routine, and you can, you're talking with God, and you're exchanging, and God's revealing to you what your week's going to hold, what's going on there. Well, pal, I wish that would happen to me. Well, why don't you start communing with God? During this COVID time, this time of the plague, I've spent a lot of time with God. Normally, I'd be out doing this. And then with the leg and the plague, (laughs) hey, he's a poet. You know, I I spent a lot of downtime. And now I'm excited. I want to do things and everything. But I want to do them in the communing with God. So... We need to realize that communion means to be intimate with God. And believe me, how many here could be a little more intimate with God? Don't raise your hands. We all could. And, and it's usually the person that isn't always picks the fault of the person to say, hey, let's commune with God. I don't like you saying that. And usually a person that does that is the person that doesn't commune with God. And immediately they have to justify it in their thinking. Don't be like that. Try it out. Listen, it says, come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Amen? He says, I've set a table. Danny quoted this the other week. He says, God set a table in the midst of our enemies. Come and eat. And right there, we're eating Jesus. We're communing with God. And the devil's going, i got to stop that. Denise is becoming more like Jesus every day. I got to stop her. Let's see. See if I can get her to worry about something. (laughs) Or whatever. I'm not not trying to give you a secret word. I'm just using you because you're hardly worried about anything. All right. The fifth point I want to make make to you is to commune with Christ is to share in what he accomplished, right? Through the body and... Blood and being seated at the right hand of God. It's going to take us time to get to know. I I married my wife, but it takes time to really get to know things. Things unfold and you get to know habits and and stuff. I I used to do a lot of marriage counseling. We, We had a whole little points that we would cover in marriage counseling. And one of the things is, can you stand your husband when he's been out fishing for two weeks Hasn't taken a bath in two weeks. His breath is terrible. His eyes are bloodshot. He hasn't shaved in two weeks. Can you look him in the eye and kiss him and say you love him? Well, good then. You started, you started on the right track. Hello. You see what I'm saying? Because if you really love and God is putting you together, the little things aren't going to bother you as much until God gets those worked out, and it takes time. 
Well, God wants to work out our un uncomfortable or us, our feeling uncomfortable uh, uh, in his presence. It takes a little time to work that out. And guaranteed, you'll settle in. You'll learn to sleep through storms because God's fighting the storm for you. You'll learn to rest when everybody's agitated. Why? Because God's got it, Amen. you see. Amen. But it takes a while to settle in. And communing in your walk with God throughout the day is very important because it gets you used to sensing God, exposure to God, listening to God, having God reveal things to you. Man, there's nothing more exciting than that. <laughs> when God says, Hey, Carrie, I want to tell you one of these little secrets. Now you're mature enough, Carrie, to really understand what I'm about to tell you. I like those. I get those a lot now. Before, when I was young, I didn't get very much of that. God wanted me to dig it out of his word, dig it out of his word, dig it out of his word. And still there are people who, who don't know their Bible. And they're the ones that are always moody and don't do that. Just skip that part of your life. <laughs> Can you say amen? All right, let's go down to my next scripture. The next point is, I am the bread of life. Who said that? Jesus. What did he mean, bread of life? What do we usually do with bread? We eat it. We eat it. We eat it. Yeah. Right. What Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I am your life. You eat me. What did Satan say? If you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, to partake of Jesus is to partake of his word. To partake of his word is to partake of Jesus. And when you're partaking of Jesus, let it be done throughout the day. And you are eating the bread of life. Can you say amen? Woo, there's nothing like it. Angel food bread. Amen. A little manna in the pajamas. Amen. Before you get up. I mean, man, you, we've got it made. It's just somehow the, the, the steak on the plate right now is out of sight until you commune with God. And then all of a sudden it's been sitting there the whole time. How many's ever looked for something? And it was there all the time. I remember one time I had my reading glasses on my head. And I'm talking to several people. Do you know where my glasses are? And, you know, they, they all looked at me like, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. Do you know where my Jesus is? It's where a lot of Christians are today. I've lost my Jesus. Get back with him. Commune with him. It is so beautiful. Because God wants to be personal with us. He doesn't want to throw us in some general basket. No, he wants to be personal with us. He wants you to know that you know that you know that you are with God and God is with you. That no devil in hell can shake your walk. Can you say amen? All right, so let's, let's look at this. I'm the better life. John 6, 47 through 52 in your notes. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, if anyone eats of this bread, he will live for ever. When you eat something, what do you do? You pick it up. You usually look at it and you pick it up and then you put it in your mouth and then you chew, right? And as you're chewing, it goes down in the stomach. What does your stomach do? It starts to digest it and all the nutrients thereof starts to go through your system. That's how you partake of God. You begin to digest his word. You begin to digest him through prayer and worship. And you begin to chew him. And, and, and it goes down into your spirit. And your spirit begins to pull off the nutrients and the revelations that directly apply to you. He pulls out of the word for you. And that's exciting. Because that means that 
There could be a hundred people under the same sermon and every one of those people could get something fresh and new even though they heard the same sermon. Hello? Same reason why somebody that has a gift of maybe teaching and a gift of leading and maybe a, a gift of, uh, of giving will look at something different. Somebody falls down, the giver will say, hey, let's get that I'll buy you another one of those. If somebody falls down, the leader will look at that and say, hey, you get a broom, you get a mop, let's get this thing together. See, it involves everybody else. While the mercy person just wants to buy them another thing. And then you got the teacher. Here, let me give you five steps on how to never drop that again. So we all look at things differently through the gifts and the callings that we have. So the word has to, therefore, by the help of the Holy Spirit, as we commune with God, the word will be personal to us, even though we're reading the same Bible. We, we're serving the same God. Why? But we all have different functions. All right, say I got it. He says, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Wow, now he's freaked out a whole bunch of people. Because the one thing the Jews were never to do is eat raw flesh. Okay, and especially human flesh, right? So a lot of these disciples are looking at, what? Cannibalism? And it says, after he said some of this, many that heard him, Stop following him. See, that's, that's the difference. You can sit in a church and listen carnally, or you can sit in a church and listen spiritually. Which one do you think is going to get it? Sure. Amen. The carnal person is going to find a fault, is going to look for an excuse, and the spiritual person is going to want more, want more, want more, want more. Why? Because he that eateth my flesh... Drinketh my blood, will live forever. So we want more of God, don't we? More of God, constantly more of God, less of us. All right, a couple of points underneath John 6. Number one, Christ's body and what he did is what we partake of or eat. Amen. He purchased all of our sufferings, all of our diseases. Can you say Amen. And by partaking of Jesus every day, you're partaking of your healing. You're partaking of your completeness and your wholeness. You're partaking of health. The word of God is healing to all your flesh. So by communing with God and being with God, you're going to become better. And the more you can spend time exchanging with God throughout the day, the quicker you're going to change. What really bothers me, if once I figured how God wanted me to know this, and, and, and I said, Lord, how come I'm growing pretty quick here, and I'm finding out there's a lot of people that don't know very much. I'm a baby Christian, and I'm saying this, okay? He says it all has to do with how bad do you want it. The people that get saved and go after it, get it. But... Blessed are those that are diligently seek him. What? They'll be rewarded. And um, so I said, well, what's, what's the key? There are some people that seem they grow quick and they seem to be together. See, those are the ones that paid attention. The, the Marys that sat at my feet. So we can choose to be a Mary or a Martha every day of the rest of our life. And I choose to be a Mary. I choose to be at Jesus' feet. Because he can show me how to lengthen my days. What do you mean? Have you ever had a day you wish you could get everything that you needed to get done, done in that day? And you couldn't do it? What God says, if you'll come and meet with me first thing, I'll lengthen your days. In other words, I'll show you how to do it quicker, faster, and without so much wasted time. Hanging out with Jesus does that to us. Can you say Amen. Communing with Jesus gives us wisdom beyond our own. Gives us knowledge beyond anything. Helps us to stay balanced. Helps us to walk in love. But it's communing with God that does that. 
You know, in the olden days, Christians used to believe it was what they experienced that made them humble. And yet my Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand. Didn't say, let circumstances humble you and you'll learn not to do that again. Well, a lot of people are still trying to practice the Old Testament in the New Testament times. Old Testament is great. Learn from their mistakes. Learn their celebration and all that wonderful things. But don't try to practice the Old Testament principles because they can't save you. They can't deliver you. They can only condemn you because the law was designed to point to the canes of life. You cannot approach God by works. You have to approach them by faith. Amen. Can you say amen? So when you and I get up in the morning, we greet God, we fellowship with God, we start communing with God, that's all done by faith. Therefore, it's written, we walk by what? Faith, faith and not by sight. sight. <coughs> Excuse me. Second part point is his body was the scapegoat for our sin and suffering and taking away our sickness. Anybody here not know what a scapegoat is? Back in the day when they sacrificed, they have two. They'll have a goat or a lamb. Two lambs or two goats or a lamb and a goat, okay? And then when the high priest got himself all cleansed and everything, he would confess the faults and the sins of the people on the goat. And then they would take the goat, I'm just making it simple, and they'd drive the goat out, okay, out of the area into the wilderness. And then they would take the blood and the meat, and they would burn the meat and sack it, take the blood and put it on the altar. Amen. Well, Jesus fulfilled both those things. He became our scapegoat because our sins were laid on him, our sicknesses were laid on him. He also became our, our sacrifice. He was burned up in the fires, you know, and then his blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Can you say amen? And so when somebody asks you, well, we haven't found the Ark of the Covenant yet. Have you ever heard that? They're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I can tell you exactly where it's at. Can't you? First of all, the blood of Jesus. Where was Jesus crucified? Calvary. And right over Calvary is a gravel pit. And right underneath the gravel pit is a great big huge cave. And under the cave is the Ark of the Covenant. And why do you think it's there, Pastor Craig? I know it was there. I don't know if it's there now. But it was there because Jesus' blood had to go down, fall down, and drip over the mercy seat. And you ever heard of a thing called gravity? And if you read, there's a guy, uh, something Wyatt out there that has a little detail on it. They found, they found, almost found the ark underneath Calvary's cross. Okay? But they shut down the dig just before he could get to it. And then he ended up dying of cancer. You know, so, so everybody, remember, they had to hide the, the body of Moses because Satan was going to make a shrine out of it. Peter had a problem, remember, with James and John. Let's build three tabernacles. The first thing, you know, we get called in the ministry, one of the greatest temptations is, well, I'm called in the ministry, I'm going to build a big church. First of all, you haven't even got with God and found out what he wants you to do. And now you're just launching out, doing what you think to do. No, spend some time communing with God. Why? Because God's going to impress upon you his desire for your life. But in order for us to understand that, we've got to get in the habit of spending time and communing with God. Someone say amen. amen. So his body was the scapegoat and the sacrifice for our sin. So let's look at Isaiah 53. This is pretty cool. Listen to this. The Isaiah is, is hundreds of years before the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right? So Isaiah 53, just 4 through 6. Actually, it should be 4 through 5. Or maybe, no, 4 through 6. Okay. Surely he has, talking about Jesus, surely Jesus has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. So now you see the scapegoat? He was bore our 
griefs and carried our... So God doesn't want you sitting weeping and crying over yourself. He doesn't want you sweating and agonizing. Oh, low is me. Woe is me. Why? Because Jesus, what did he do? He bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. So we're not supposed to be carrying them around. Yet, he says, we did esteem him stricken and smitten by God. Hey, God's doing this for, to Jesus for some reason. Yeah. And afflicted. They saw him. Now remember, this is way before Jesus died and rose again. Even Psalms 22 talks about a time when Jesus hung on the cross way before he did. It's called a prophecy. And it says, he's smitten by God. Well, did God smite Jesus? No, but he laid our iniquities on him and our sins, didn't he? So he could be looked as God doing this. But God wasn't doing this in the fact that punishing Jesus. No, he was putting all that on Jesus so Jesus could be our scapegoat and carry it off into the wilderness. Now, if Jesus carried those things off in the wilderness, let's not let the devil talk us into grieving and sorrowing and thinking, poor me, poor me, poor me. Say amen. And we all, not now, but, you know, we've all gone through things like that too. So let's go on. So he says, but he was wounded for our transgression. Okay. Punched, his beard ripped off. He was beat on top of the head with the thorns. He was whipped, the cat of nine tails. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement or punishment of our peace, or to pay the price for our peace, was upon him. And by his stripes, we are. See the word are? It didn't say going to be. It says we are. So God is actually establishing the word of healing. It's like electricity in the wall. You want access for your toaster? Take that little thing with the knobs on the end, stick it into the electricity. What's wrong with a lot of people today is they're not staying plugged into God. They're unplugging, plugging in, unplugging, unplugging, because their flesh is talking them in and out of stuff with the enemy's suggestions. Say, that's not me. That's not me. Amen. It's not, not us. We're not going to let that happen to us. Then it goes on, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to everyone to his own way. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. We've turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on Jesus, on him, the iniquity of us all. Aren't you glad? See, so Jesus became that last sacrifice, that very substance to carry away all of our sin and debt. So why, Pastor Kerry, do we experience these things like sicknesses and stuff, plagues and all that kind of stuff? Because in the world we'll have tribulation. But fear not, little flock. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Now you go, well, that's pretty cool. But I'm not Jesus. No, but the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. If you're in Christ, where are you? In Christ! If you're in the house, where are you? You're in the house. If you're in the church, where are you? You're in the and if you're in Christ, really, spiritually speaking, you are in Christ. But you don't always think like you're in Christ. Yet the Bible declares you're in Christ. But you don't think that you're in Christ, but you are in Christ. So therefore, you're beginning to learn that there's head knowledge you don't think you're in Christ. And there's heart knowledge. I'm in Christ. Now, which one do you act on? Head knowledge or heart knowledge? Heart knowledge. And I see a lot of people who are following Jesus. You've heard me say it many times. By head knowledge. They're going through the motion with all the effort they can muster up. And they're still falling short and failing. Why is that? Because unless God is in the project... It won't hold together. He holds all things together. We don't do it for his honor. 
and out of love for others, it'll burn up. So God says, now, this is how it's done. Do not stick the knife into the electric socket. You put the little plug in there that's designed for. Therefore, don't run off on your own thinking you can do everything on your own just because you confess Jesus. Keep your little plug in the light socket there, right in there where it belongs, and stay close to God till he teach you until Christ be formed in you. Amen. Because plugging and unplugging and unplugging and plugging will just stunt your growth. And folks, these are the last days. We need to grow quick. And the only one that can grow us up is him. God Almighty can grow us up. Circumstances don't do it. Just reading your Bible doesn't do it. You have to spend time with him. Then he grows us from the inside out. It's the exposure to the growth son of God that causes that growth. Not exposure to problems, not exposure to life, not exposure to the word only. It's exposure to God's presence that causes us to mature. Everyone say amen. amen. So communion is a must. No more you can get in the presence of God and as often as you can, the faster you're going to grow. Amen. I love that. So really, the people that are, seem not to be growing, you could all counsel them and say, what aren't they doing? They're not with God. They're not fellowshipping with God. Or they haven't. This is probably what I believe more. They don't value what they have. Nobody's really showed them how much to value the word, the, their relationship with God. And so they could take it or leave it. And that's what's wrong with second generational Christians where mom or dad were Christians and you are now the child of a... You take for granted that mom's prayers and dad's prayers. No, you got to go after it individually for yourself. If you don't, you're going to learn from the school of hard knocks. We want you to commune with God and not be knocked around. Can you say amen? All right, finishing with you. Back to John 6. There's a scripture in 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. I'll read in a minute. But you go back to John 6 there in your Bible. And so 1 Peter 2, 24 says what? Who himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin. See, if you get up every morning and say, God, I present myself, immediately God considers you dead to sin and your body shuts down to sin. So that's what it says right here. We having died to sins, plural, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you, you are healed. We're healed. So now we have an are healed and a were healed. Say are healed and were healed. So in other words, the provision of your absolute healing is present. Isn't it amazing when they were writing about Jesus that he had went into his own hometown and it says that the power of God was present there to heal all people, yet only a few got healed. Because of their mind was way off somewhere. Listen, as a man thinketh in his heart, can shut down the blessings of God to you. I'm never worthy enough to, to give. Don't say that. So let's move on. All right. Amen. So just pretend. So by his stripes, you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Say amen. So who should you commune with? The shepherd and the bishop of your souls. So then Jesus said to them in John 6, 53, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood and has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, partakes of my life, abides in me and I in him. As a living father sent me, so I have 
So I live, excuse me, because of the Father. So he will see, so he who feeds on me. What do we do? Feed. Where do we feed on him at? In the word, in prayer. It, throughout the day communion, we're feeding on God. Who gives us our energy? Who gives us our breath? Our thoughts. We feed on him every day, but we've got to set our mind on doing it. The mind has to be on what you're doing, not just accepting it. Hello. Because the blessing is there, but you've got to be aware it's there so you can get it from there into here. So we, you see what I'm saying? So you've got to be aware that it's there before you can partake of it. And if you're aware that it's there, then the enemy might come in and he might say, well, you don't know how to, how to receive something like that. Yes, you do. Open your heart. God's just waiting to come on in. And he's also waiting to show us things and to minister to heal us of our sickness. The reason why I don't have a problem praying for anybody, because I know God wants everybody healed. Now, does everybody get healed? No. But I'm going to pray like everybody's going to get healed. And when I pray for somebody, I'm not going to doubt before I pray for them. I'm going to pray for them to get healed. And another thing I try to tell people is, don't think that you have to try to get them healed. You do the little thing. Lay hands on them, pray the prayer of faith over them, and then turn them to God and let God do the healing part. But it's really not that hard. Because once we commune with God throughout the day, trying to muster up faith... That's just a joke. You have enough faith. You have enough everything. Now you can relax, settle in, because you're communing with God. So you don't have to pray him up. You don't have to stir yourself up for the ministry. You just step off into the glory of God. The only times, and I believe this, but you might, you know, just so listen to me carefully. I believe the only times Jesus went and talked a lot with his father on a serious mode is when he had to make serious choices and when he was getting a little drained. Everybody got his, their idea that, oh, that Jesus was Jesus. He never suffered any temptations. Why? He never had any hard times. You know, he never was betrayed. He never was lied to. Uh, you know that. So... How did he handle it? He handled it when it started to get to him. He went and talked to his father. But yet throughout the day, he was talking with his father. And people were pulling on him and asking to be healed. And they were draining on him all the time. So he was constantly communing with his father to keep the batteries full. Can you say amen? To keep himself charged up. And finally finishing with you. A couple of points I want to make. The life we get when we commune with God amplifies his power and presence to transform us. It's the Greek word zoe. Everyone say zoe. zoe. Okay, two, God wants us again to become a part of his plan and purpose. But we do that by getting instructions first thing every morning. We are to know what God desires for us. And in order to know that, we have to plan to spend time and commune with him. Thirdly, notice, he who eats and drinks of Christ becomes full of God. Then he who abides in Christ will receive eternal blessings, and eternal favor, starting with forgiveness and receiving God's nature inside of them and becoming a part of God's plan. Say, I am a part of God's big plan. I'm like a finger with God. Touch me not. Lest you want to get smited devil. And touch me not. Lest you want to be healed world. Because you're, you're carriers of an infectious gospel. I know those were bold statements. But they were good. Hebrews 2. Listen to this. And then Hebrews 10. I'm going to just give it to you real quick. 2.14 says, Insomuch as the children have 
partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same that through his death he might destroy him who had the power of death. And that is the devil. And release those, that's us, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We are released now, for indeed he does not give aid to the angels, but this aid he gives from the sea to Abraham. Can you say amen? Then Hebrews 10, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter in the holiness by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil, that's his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some but exhorting one another so much as you see the day approaching you see we need to be trained people are going to come they're going to ask you how can I get this day taken care of in my life what are you going to do somebody comes to you and they got a real big problem do you know enough scripture to show them what to do? You can't tell them what to do, but you can read the scripture and tell them, practice that. Hello. Amen. So we've seen a lot of that in the last couple of days, haven't we? All right. So remember this. So we'll say, everyone say, oh, remember this. Okay. Jesus bought and paid for us in full. We have every right to commune with God in the face of the devil. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus purchased us. Jesus wiped away our sin and our curse. And we should be thankful, appreciate him by walking and communing, exchanging our, our conversation with him throughout the day. Well, if you got something out of that, give the Lord a hand clap, will you?